or sorry Ephesians chapter 3 and then 1 Timothy 4 Ephesians 3 and then 1 Timothy 4 Okay, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I have wrote afore in a few, in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Okay, when you read, now if you would, 1 Timothy 4, verse 13. Okay, 1 Timothy 4, 13. Uh, Paul was uh, writing Timothy, and he just uh, said this idea. He said, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Okay, so reading leads to exhortation. And then that leads to doctrine. So if you would, let's go and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand this idea. Help us realize what uh, you have done in your wisdom. That uh, most of the words that you communicate to us is through a book. And I pray you'd help us to be people that read that book. And I pray that you'd help us to understand this idea. And help us, to, each and every one of us, to Be motivated to read uh, something in this book every single day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, Have uh, any of you written letters, email, sent a text, somebody, so you're sending words, and they misunderstood what you said? Okay, obviously. That's the problem with words. The problem with words on a page is there's a high chance of being misunderstood because they don't see the spirit of your writing. They don't see your facial expressions. They, don't, uh, they are not um, able to ask you a question right off the bat. And the, draw, the, uh, the drawback on written words is that the reader can misinterpret what's said. But if the reader has your best interest at heart and loves you and is sincere, if something that they've read from you was misunderstood or they took it wrong, they will go back to you and ask you, this is how I took it, am I wrong? Now, that's what God has done in his infinite wisdom, is that he has put his words in a book. And most people do not give God the benefit of the doubt. Therefore, they misinterpret what he said. And that's God's intended purpose. Why he's checking their heart out. Now, that's a masterful way of dealing with people. It's an amazing thing what God has done. In the fall of 1987, this church gave me an old Schofield reference Bible, very, very big Bible. That became my uh, Bible that I used because I started pastoring Rensselaer Church at that time. And I started writing all my notes in that, in that Bible. And uh, after about 20 years, 20 uh, some years, my kids got debating who's going to get dad's Bible. Okay, because they were deciding who was going to get it because they wanted all the notes and everything out of it. And so uh, I said, okay, I'll start transferring all my notes into another Bible. But then I got five kids. That's going to take two years each each time. That's going to take me another decade for each of the children to have their own personal reference Bible. So I, you know, I was asking the Lord, could I somehow try to put this on a computer program? And uh, develop my own reference Bible. Uh, And that was my only intentions. I had no other further intentions with that. So in the spring of 2000, I sat down behind a computer with my old school for a reference Bible and a family Bible. And I had a computer program and I kind of got to figure out how to do it. 
And the first night on the task, I started Genesis chapter 1, and I stayed up till like 2 in the morning. And the next morning, my wife says, uh, if you're going to do this project, I would suggest that you pace yourself. <laughs> and so I started pacing myself. So in that spring of 2000, I spent 40 to 50 hours a week on the average, uh, counting vacations and everything if we'd take off. Uh, in front of it, the uh, computer developing the Common Man's Reference Bible. I knew the title of the, the reference Bible that I wanted to produce right from the start because that's what I am. I consider myself a common boy, a common plow boy. That was William Tyndale told a Catholic priest years ago, there's going to be a day a common plow boy knows more Bible than you do. Now, saying that to a Roman Catholic priest is not saying much because they don't know much anyway. But still, the idea, that's, that's what the idea was. So um, it took me about two and a half years, so I got about halfway through the Bible, uh, starting in Genesis. I got through uh, the Old Testament, or the Genesis to Deuteronomy, and then I had to reformat everything. There was some issue. And so about two and a half years, I got to the middle of the Bible, about Psalm. And then it was like a second wind took over, and uh, in one year, I got the, whole, the second half done. So in uh, about August of that year, I began looking for a publisher. A guy up in Michigan said, no, we ain't going to publish that Bible. And so I said, okay, that's fine. I went someplace else. And I kept uh, proofreading and trying to perfect it. Well, in 2004 is when I had my first edition of the Common Man's Reference Bible published. At the time, I thought, okay, maybe if I could sell these 2,000 copies and break even, that would be fine. And Danny, that would be miraculous in itself. I was figuring they're going to stay in boxes, you know, and all that stuff. And here we are now, 2011, published the second edition, 2014, the third edition. And a month ago, published the fourth edition, which has the red letter. Last year, uh, I had a hardback edition. And so this amazingly has surprised me. I never would, never would have dreamed it's gone this far, where I'm sending them all around the world uh, without any fanfare without any uh, multi-million dollar corporation funding it as far as um, advertising it, anything like that, it's just basically word of mouth or on the internet. And all that started just because I wanted to spend some time reading the, what God said. And the idea is that I, I um, somebody has asked me why I don't put a concordance in it, and I've told each every time, I said, I would pray and hope that you become your own concordance. That's the goal. Have your own reference Bible. Okay, where, and how do we do that? Well, get you a, a, a good quality. I think I know of where you can get one. And uh, have a good pen. And when you read the Bible every single day, start writing in it, marking up, underlining passages, circling things. Uh, going to a cross-reference here, writing it there, writing it there, back and forth. This morning, I just want to basically encourage you to read the Bible. I know that's an amazing thing. You go to Christian colleges, you would think they're going to read the Bible. Most of the time, they read books about the Bible. They don't read the Bible. Rarely do they read the Bible. That's about like eating a picture of a banana rather than eating the banana. So now when we get a book, we start reading it. Reading hopefully leads us to further study. Where we read something that perks our curiosity. Say, well, I want to study that. I want to study that idea or that section or whatever. Study is where strength comes from. The King James Bible is the only one that tells you to study it. All the new Bibles take that, verse out, that word out, study, and they put something else in its replacement. Study is where strength comes from because when you've got a stick-built house, every 16 inches you've got a stud. And that's how the strength is in that, studying. Now, studying would hope to lead us to memorization. Memorization of passages in a Bible helps cleanse our mind, helps clean up our mind. Okay, and then meditation gets it from our mind into our heart. You can memorize passages of Scripture, but that really doesn't come into you until you get it in your heart. David said, 
He said about thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's meditation where that is being engrafted within one's nature. If you have an area in life where you're having a difficulty, get in the Bible, find verses that deal with that area of your weakness and memorize those things and then ask God to meditate that and put that in your heart. And you'll discover that that area of life becomes stronger just from a book. Just spending time reading what this book says. Now, when a person just picks up this Bible and starts reading, if you look at it from just a literary viewpoint, nothing to do with spirituality, nothing to do with God or anything, if you just look at this Bible from a literary viewpoint, this is a masterpiece. It's an amazing masterpiece. I got Harvard University did a study on the Bible from a literary viewpoint. And they came out and said that Greek, Hebrew, and English are the only languages where it develops a picture in your mind as you're reading them. And they said, from a literary viewpoint, they said that this Bible mirrors the originals. They really bragged about this book, just from a literary viewpoint. Now, from a spiritual viewpoint, if you would look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, there's a lot of people... Amazingly, that read even a King James Bible, but they don't get anything out of it really per se. And the reason why is they don't believe it. First Thessalonians chapter two. Now, here's the benefit when you believe what the words say, that it is actually what God's words. First Thessalonians two thirteen. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, You received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. This book becomes effective. Now, what does it do? If you would go backwards to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And it's amazing that this is almost without effort. A lot of people are trying to sanctify their lives with all these works and all these rules, and they're trying to live their life in in um, Salt Lake City in Utah. Mormon women are some of the biggest pill popper, poppers in in this country. Is because they're taking some standards that they think are coming out of the Bible, and they're trying to live these standards without Christ, and they can't deal with it. So they're popping the pills. To try to deal with life. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to, quote, live a sanctified life upon their own efforts through the flesh. Baptists do the same thing. Okay, now, it's almost without effort when we allow the spirit, when we believe what the book says, it becomes effective. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 puts it this way. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face. Now, that's common saying like an open mind or open heart. But he says, open face, behold, beholding as in a glass. Okay, in the old days, they they called this a looking glass. We call it a mirror. Okay, so they're looking in the looking glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And what's he doing? Verse, the next verse. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we receive, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, nor walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. So what a person is doing is when you open up this book, Okay, there is an image that's coming off the pages. The Spirit of God, the author, pushes an image off these pages, and the image is Jesus Christ. So when you're reading this book, you're reading about Jesus Christ, and the more you got your nose in this book, that Spirit starts changing your image to be like Christ. It's almost without effort when you believe the words. It starts with believing the words. That's when it becomes effective. And then when you ask the Spirit... I don't get this. Would you please help me? Then that spirit of God, just take that book and start molding your life. And before you know what's happening, you're starting to change. And that's what God does to it. Now, when a person gets ready to read this book, there's some, this, uh, this is not a rocket science thing here. I often ask people, 
If you don't understand a book, any book written by any man, if you don't understand the book, who would be the best qualified person to explain it to you? Well, they said, well, the author. Okay, now, would that not be right, you know, intelligent thing to do when you open up this book, pray to the author? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 is the prayer, if you want to pray it specifically. And it says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. Okay, so you're giving credit to the book. Now, free course, what does that mean? It's a legal term. The Bible is a legal document, okay, where this is a document from the judge of the universe. And so you're going to find a bunch of legal terms in this. Several years ago, I hosted law classes, and some of those law classes kind of drive us nuts. But uh, the law classes that I discovered, I learned a lot of Bible from the law classes because this book's a law book. Free course is a term in admiralty law. Admiralty law is the laws on the high seas. When you take on, a, when you get on a ship on the high seas, like the old pirates and all those things, the captain was the final authority on the ship. And the law, on the high seas is when the, the ship is sailing, to sail on free course is meaning that you have a, sh, a wind that is blowing you favorably toward your destination to go on free course. Do you see the analogy? The Spirit of God is the wind. Okay, and so when a person is praying, I don't understand what I'm praying, okay? You're praying that the wind, the Spirit of God, the author of the Bible would blow you to the direction God wants. What's that? The glory of Jesus Christ. Now, a person may not know those legal terms, so you can pray very simply like Psalm 119, verse 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Or you can do the one that Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, enlighten mine eyes. He wrote that in Colossians 1. Or you can bring it down to the common vernacular. Lord, I am dumber than a box of rocks and I can't figure it out. Would you please show me something? That'll work too. And then you start reading it, and you'll see what God does. He does the work. He gets the credit. The book gets the glory, and God gets the credit. See, now, when you're reading this book, you look for historical applications. Okay? You can read doctrinal things, that, and that direct, the doctrinal things direct you Godward. You can read the instructional things and get some practical things out of the Bible. And that, that shows you towards manward idea, personalizing it. And then you can look at some prophetic things. Now, when I say personalize what the Bible says, I'm saying look at it, how it helps you or convicts you. Don't be reading it saying, hey, dear, you need this first. You know, that's how most people do it. You know, guys in jail, we, we get talking about some things, and usually drinking would come up because most of them had a problem with that, and they'd say, well, Jesus drank wine. I said, well, he did. I didn't know that. So you have this great truth that Jesus drank wine, so that means that's why you drink wine, right? I said, well, Jesus preached also. Do you do that? Do uh, you pray? Because Jesus prayed. Well, you did a lot of, oh, oh, you're just only picking the one thing that you think Jesus did. And then I'd show him three verses. And I'd show him Matthew 26, 29, where it says that Jesus had new wine. And then I'd take him to Isaiah 65, verse 8, where it says new wine is found in a cluster. And then I'd take him to Genesis 40, verse 10, it says that clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Now tell me, what's new wine? And they wouldn't argue that. Three very simple verses, you see. And the idea is that here they're trying to use the Bible to beat somebody else with it. Or they're trying to use the Bible to say, well, you're wrong here. Yeah, but how about you? How about you get in the Bible and let God tell you where you're wrong? That's what God intends for us. Okay, and so when a person gets into this Bible and you start reading it. Now, there are several examples in the Bible of somebody reading it. Publicly, in Joshua chapter 8, Joshua read the Old Testament law to the Jews 
corporately to the entire body of people. If you would look at Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, in verse, verses 1 through 8, basically gives a, a, a rough pattern of a public service uh, or a public worship service, you want to call it that. But in Nehemiah 8, verse 8, there's a three-point outline here. And if you, follow, if you follow numerology, 8 is a number for new beginnings. And boy, this would be a new beginning in a lot of churches that just did this. And it says, so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly. So first thing they did is they read some things out of the Bible. Book of the law. You go to the average church and sit outside in front of it and watch people walk in. Most of them don't even carry a Bible. That's about like going to the shooting range without a gun. So they're not carrying a Bible because they probably got something on the screen. And then it says, and gave the sense. Gave the sense. That's the explanation. If the explanation of the, t- the passage is proper, the person will walk away and say, well, now that makes sense. Now, when it makes sense, the next thing caused them to understand the reading. Understanding the reading, that's what the Bible calls inspiration. Inspiration, the scholars always make it a past tense word. When the Bible says inspiration is a present tense word. All scripture is given by inspiration. And the word is only found two times in the Bible, and they never go back to read the first occurrence to get the definition. That's an easy one to define. But they don't read the first verse. Job 32, 8. That one defines inspiration. Inspiration is when a person understands what God said. That's present tense. That's a three-part here in verse uh, 8. And when a guy has done the job properly, then a person might say to me, like a guy said to me one time, well, when I listen to you, I don't need a dictionary. Appreciate that. <laughs> you, got it, you got it? Figured it out. Okay, now in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, Jesus went into the Jewish synagogue and he opened up a Bible and read it. He just read a very short passage. But you know, people have all these excuses. Well, I don't read the Bible. Why? Why? Isaiah 29 gives the excuses. There's two basic excuses. Isaiah 29. The thing about the Bible that's fascinating is that it uh, basically prophesies about people's excuses. Isaiah 29, verse 11. This is what Isaiah said. He said this. The vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. Oh, I don't understand the Bible. It's figurative. It's, you know, allegory. It's a metaphor. It's beautiful literature. It's sealed. Which men deliver to one that is learned. So this guy's got, you know, a lot of degrees. Okay, PhD, you know, post hole digger and all that stuff. And it says, reading. He says, uh, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot. It is sealed. So that's the argument you're going to get from the educated crowd. Oh, it's it's, you know, it's got so many interpretations. Okay, then you go to the, the redneck that's got, you know, some skull in his back pocket. And he's got the Confederate flag on his, you know, on his pickup. And he's got a nice big shotgun in the back window. And he ain't got much education, you know. Well, you give him a Bible and it says in verse 12, And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I am not learned. What, can you read sixth grade? English, pal? You don't think so? Then you can read a King James Bible. Susanna Wesley, the way she taught her children how to read, all her kids, she'd teach them phonics. On their fifth birthday, she'd take uh, in the morning and teach them phonics. And then in the afternoon, they started reading Genesis chapter 1, and they learned how to read from the Bible. She did that with every one of her children. Genesis chapter 1, you're reading about fifth grade reading level. As, as you come through the Bible chronologically, it, it kind of progresses up to the seventh grade level. On the average, it's a sixth grade reading level. Now, I say sixth grade. That was probably American education about 70 years ago. Now, it'd probably be, you know, upper postgraduate, the way things have become nowadays. Okay, but that's amazing how this book is. Isaiah said in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. 
Read it. You know one of the favorite questions Jesus would throw out at the, the scribes and Pharisees? He had a, one of his sayings, you, you remember it, he said it seven times in Revelation. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. It's a kind of a funny saying. Okay? And he would say that, but then when the scribes and Pharisees, all the religious upstarts of his day, would come to him, he said, haven't you read? In Matthew, you find that six times. Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read? I mean, it's about like Obama said one time in his camp, uh, now campaign, one time as, as president, he read, everybody knows what the good book says, that people that live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. You know, I don't remember reading that. I don't remember reading that. And Al Gore one time tried to be real spiritual. You know, he was going to say John three sixteen, And he said, you know, everybody knows that one verse, John sixteen three. <laughs> I mean, these guys have never opened up this book in their lives because they're Bible phobes. You know, they say we're, you know, other phobics. Well, they're phobic of the Bible. Now, there's a fella in, in Acts chapter 8. He's an Ethiopian. He was a religious Jew. He had been, uh, he jumped on Judaism. Uh, and so he was, uh, he went to the, Jerusalem and he's on his way home. And he had a copy of Isaiah and he was reading it in his chariot. And he's reading it out loud. And the Spirit of God said to Philip, hey, you, you need to go talk to that guy. So Philip takes off running. And he hears the guy reading. And he went up to the side of the chariot. And the guy hit the power thing. And the window came down. And he said, you know what you're reading? You understand what you're reading? The guy said, how can I some man, except some man guide me? And he jumped in that chariot, sat right beside him. He said, well, look at there. You're reading Isaiah 53. He said, well, how'd you know that? Well, that's, look at that. He's talking, man. I, and he preached on him, Jesus, and the man got saved. And it started from him reading personally what the book says. Now, there are several, you know, patterns or plans that people have for reading. I don't know if you have a pattern or a plan, okay, but uh, get something. I'm not saying you got to read 10 pages a day. Sam Gipp preaches about that, and I think that's a good thing. Read 10 pages a day. Sam reads 30 pages a day. That's a lot of reading, okay? And so uh, 10 pages a day, I'm not saying that. It's not how much you read. It's how much it reads you. And if you're a slow reader, man, just, you know, it only took David one stone to take that giant down. And one verse just might take that giant down in your life. But get a plan for reading. Now, you can do what my wife's been doing. She's been handwriting the Bible. She's gone through the entire New Testament. She's probably up in what, 2 Kings, 1 Kings? Chronicles. Handwrite. I'm not going to do that. Unless the Lord says so. <laughs> but, man, you're seeing every word with that. Every single thing. And you're getting some things out of that. Okay, but some people read a psalm a day. Have you ever heard that? Reading a psalm a day. You've got 150 psalms, so you're going through the psalms every five months. So if you start at January, chapter, January 1, Psalm 1, and you go through the five months, go through another five months, you start it again in November. Okay, so today is the 12th, so you read Psalm 12. So flip to Psalm 12. And here's what I would do if I'm going to start my daily reading in Psalm. I said, Lord, would you please show me some things in your book? I need some things. Lord, if it's going to be positive, negative, I don't care what it is, whatever you want me to have, help me to get it what you want me to get. I don't want a preconceived idea. I know my heart is deceitful above all things. Lord, please show me something. So I start reading, help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. Boy, ain't that true, Lord. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. Yeah, yeah, I better not do that. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and a tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Who is that, Lord? Who are you talking about? Who's doing all this talking? Well, it says in verse 1, you said they're godly men, and they're doing all this talking... I don't, know, I don't know about that. Verse 4, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. Arise? Second coming? Boy, that sounds good. Lord, I'd like you to come back. I will set him in safety 
from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Ah, now I see who you're talking about. Somebody doesn't believe you've kept your words perfect. And those guys over here in verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 are trying to overthrow you by their big fat mouth. Lord, thank you for that book. David said seven times a day, do I praise you for that righteous judgment. Do you thank God for his book? Well, if you read a proverb a day, then you're going to go through the Proverbs every 12 months. So today is the 12th, Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs is, uh, Proverbs is one that helps us with practical things of life. Uh, and um, Psalms works on our heart. Maybe you can start Proverbs chapter 1 or 12, verse 1. Lord, please help me out here. It says, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Lord, Lord, I sure do love your book. A good man obtain the favor of the Lord, but a wicked man devices will he condemn. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. Lord, thank you. You give me one of those. Instead of, dear, you need to read this over here in Proverbs chapter 31 and make sure that you get all those things down pat. You know that? Jan and I used to go up to Camp Summit, and there's a Catholic fellow that liked it when we came in. He just loved it when we come in, and we got talking after one service. He said, I read a couple of them, them, them verses in Proverbs, and this one said, it is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than in a wide house with a brawling woman. He said, boy, that one really got me. I said, you got some experience? He said, yes, I do. <laughs> I said, that verse found three times in there. He said, yeah, I found a couple of them. Boy, oh boy. So I said, you had a kind of a rough marriage, did you? He said, yes, I did. <laughs> he got, he, that one touched his heart. <laughs> but uh, when we read through those Proverbs. Proverbs will help on your mind. Now, whatever Bible program or method you, some people like to read through the Bible, start in the front, go three and a half chapters, four chapters every single day, and you read through the entire Bible in a year. Okay, another method you could, if you look at the Old Testament, it's got 929 chapters. You subtract Psalms and Proverbs. You're down to 748. If you're going to do that every year, you need to read only two chapters. Start in Genesis 1. Today's November 12th. You'd be around Jeremiah 30, 31 in that range. And before you read Jeremiah, you just sit down and, and ask the Lord, please show me some things. I don't know how... Something that a guy wrote 2,600 years ago is going to help me, but it will. It will. And then another thing I like to do is I like to read a gospel a day. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are 89 chapters. So if you divide that by three, you almost got 30. One day you got 29. And so that way you could actually walk with the Lord Jesus Christ every single day. So today's November 12th. If you start at the beginning of the year, you'd be on your fourth time around. And it'd be Mark chapter 15 where you'd be at. And you'd be reading about the crucifixion. And you keep all those things fresh in your mind. And you don't lose your first love for Jesus Christ. Sometimes when people go to Israel, I went to Israel one time. Jan and I are scheduled to go next June to Israel. And a lot, sometimes when people go to Israel, they get this ooey-gooey feeling. You know, they did on our tour. Ooh, I am where Jesus walked. And it's kind of gaggy, kind of pukey type feeling, I think. Uh, because it's not where Jesus walks is important. It's what he said that was important. And a lot of those people on that tour was reading all these newfangled Bibles and Ron Wyatt, and it kind of got under his skin about six days into it. And then he asked me, hey, so would you do a talk on the Bible? I said, I would be glad to. And so on uh, Thanksgiving Day, my 40th birthday, it happened to be that year, uh, we were traveling from Jerusalem down to a lot. I got to be on the bus, on that, on that tour bus, about 36 people, 30-some people. 
I preached, I, I gave a little chat on uh, the perfection of the King James Bible. I took seven statements I knew they'd all agree with and then mixed them all together and the King James Bible pops out. And you know what? They avoided me the rest of that tour. Ron liked it. The Jewish guide liked it. Brent was okay with it. He was fine. But everybody else avoided me like the plague from then on out. Kind of took away that little fakey spirituality because they didn't believe the book. And the Jewish guide said to me later in a week, he said, uh, David, he said, uh, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. He said, you know what? You don't act like one. I said, thank you, Mika. Appreciate that. <laughs> and then later on, he said, David, I like you. And I said, appreciate that, Mika. He said, that's, that's quite a compliment. I knew it was a compliment coming from a Jew. That was quite a compliment. And I, I kind of question the salvation. I really don't know if he's a saved man. But uh, it was a blessing, though, that, that trip. So if you're going to read a gospel a day, you're going to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to stay grounded and solid of the doctrines for today, Paul's writings, you got, uh, have 84 chapters there with Paul's writings. So you're going to be running through those every three months. If you start with Romans to Philemon, I'm not counting Hebrews in that right now. So you're going to be running that every three months. And uh, then you got 87 chapters left over in the New Testament where you would have Acts, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, all the way through. That would be 87 chapters also. So today would be James chapter 2. If you're reading through Paul's writings, today would be 2nd Corinthians chapter 11. Now, a lot of these people, they say, well, I have a Pauline ministry. And I'd read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I see that Paul got, you know, beat 40 times, save one, five times, shipwrecks. And I say, I don't think I'd be arrogant to say I got a Pauline ministry, because I sure don't got a Pauline ministry. <laughs> These guys claiming they do. Well, what's Pauline, Paul's qualifications for the ministry? Read 2 Corinthians 11, 23 and following. And you will see that none of us qualify for his type of a ministry. And you get those ideas just from reading the Bible. Now, if a person follows that program, you'd read seven chapters a day. Now, that's not a bad number. But whatever plan or whatever decision you make or develop, get something and read every day. One verse, two verses, whatever. I mean, one's better than nothing. But start with something. Read it. And when you read it, before you read it, ask the author to take those words and change you into the image. I mean, that's going to be coming along with it because you believe what the words say. And the Lord will minister to your spirit while we're reading this book, and you'll, and you'll feel like when you're reading this, oh, that thing's looking at me. That thing is looking at my heart. And you want to close it sometimes and say, I wish you would stop looking at my heart. And that's why people stay away from it. There's a common saying that goes like this. Sin will keep you from the Bible. Or the Bible will keep you from sin. Spend time reading it. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to be people that read your word. doesn't matter how much, but help us to be people that open up this wonderful book that you've given, this flawless, pure, perfect book that you've given. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to read it. And while we're reading it, help us to step up and study it. And then memorize some things that we have weak areas in our lives. And we can be honest and say, I have these weak areas in my life, so I'm going to memorize these verses. And while you get memorized in your head, you ask the Spirit of God, please engraft that into my heart, into my life. And then we won't even notice it, but we'll start seeing changes into the glory, into the image of Christ. Lord, I just pray you'd help us to be people that read your words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed with that.